Gary Johnson here, and I'm getting ready to interview B. Jordan. B. Jordan, I've been going back and forth with her for about six months. I discovered her on YouTube, and she was really, really impressive with her cover of the song, If I Ever Lose This Heaven. And we'll talk about that in the interview. But what I'm really excited about is what she's been doing since then and how many views this song has done and the new song that she is getting ready to release today. So sit back and enjoy my interview with V. Now, don't let a book, what is it? Don't judge a book by its cover? Don't do that, okay? She's a proud Cuban Mexican. She can sing gospel. She can sing Latin. She can sing R&B. She's classically trained as a pianist. She's currently working as a vocal coach, and she's got a lot more going on. Ladies and gentlemen, check out my exclusive interview with V. Jordan. Everybody, this is Gary Johnson with the Calculations Talk Show. I've been waiting for months for this moment. We have V. Jordan with us. If I ever lose this heaven, V, how are you? Talk to us. Hey, hello, Gary. Wow, this is this is really cool. Thank you so much for having me. Um, boy, this is just such a blessing to be to be seen and to be heard by by all these people. So I'm stoked to talk to you and ready to answer any of your questions. Well, let's uh, let me just put some of this in context because I want this interview. I'm probably going to do this interview backwards. Okay. So I'm going to start up front Ready. and there are people who have heard the song, If I Ever Lose This Heaven, yeah. which was originally on um, Quincy Jones' Body Heat album mm -hmm. featuring Minnie Ripperton, the late, great Minnie Ripperton, yes. Leon Ware, singer, songwriter, and Al Jarreau, the late Al Jarreau. Yes. Big hit yeah. back then, big hit. Then all of a sudden, it's popularized again by the average white band. Mm -hmm. And then some four decades later, some meteor named V. Jordan comes out and hey. she does a, All right. <laughs> a YouTube. All and right. the reason I say meteor, because I'm going to back it up with analytics, okay? All right, here we go. All right, so you go on YouTube and let's say the Body Heat album and the song uh, in six years, 302,000 views on YouTube. Okay, hmm. respectable. Mm -hmm. Average white band, their version, 99,000 views. Man, that's, that's crazy. Yes, but now you want to talk crazy. Let's talk to the V. Jordan. Right. Oh my goodness. V. Jordan, 1.7 million and counting. Just and this is all since 2019. We're not talking six years ago. Yeah. What happened? What what do you think and how does it feel to have this kind of success? Man, um, I don't even know where to begin. Honestly, it was such a shock to kind of have this happen. We filmed this back in November 2019-ish. We put it out January 2020. COVID hits. Lockdown. I had a big party right before it. I had some of the guys from Earth, Wind and Fire come on over to my place and, and promote it for me and it was amazing. And then when everything got shut down, everything kind of slowed down a bit. I had maybe about 30K views in those first couple of months, which was incredible. My first YouTube video I've ever put out. It was incredible. Okay. And, and then a year goes by and August 2021, I get a call from my producer. He's like, hey, have you been promoting the video? I'm like, um, what are you talking about? He's like, we just hit 80K in like a day. What happened? I was like, what are you talking about? So I go and I check it out and I'm just seeing the numbers. Like every time I refresh the page, you know, and it just keeps going up and up and up and up. And before I knew it, we were at 100K and I was like, what is going on here? What's kind of what's the engine behind this we have no idea this is so random it's a year later and some change so we kind of found out that it's been playlisted um in different parts of the world so it started in ireland went to scotland you know average white band was a scottish band yep. so it kind of got playlisted out there and people started finding it for some reason and then youtube picked it up 
and it just got onto onto the right algorithms, I guess. And it started getting playlisted here in the U.S. and made it all the way back to my hometown in Los Angeles, where I started getting calls from friends who were seeing it for the first time. Um, uh, so, and then it just it just kept going. We hit a million in like three months. So it, it was it was incredible. It was so um, exciting to watch that happen. And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just happy. I just feel. I, I tried. Happy. I tried to do my part. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there were people like you promoting me, you know, left and right with articles and showing the video everywhere. And I would see my video pop up in not just in people's socials, but in people's like in magazines and different articles and pretty much anywhere they were talking about average white band or if I ever lose this heaven, my video was popping up. So yeah. it was crazy to see the video go to like the number one spot on YouTube when you type in if I ever, <laughs> if lose, I ever lose this heaven. heaven. Yeah, you oh, pop up. Band? Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, it was insane. It was really, really insane. All really right, insane. now I got to I got to back you up here a little bit because you you were just so casually mentioned. Oh yeah, and I got some members of Earth, Wind, and Fire to show up. Yeah. <laughs> Time out. How does that happen? Because the name of this show is Calculations. Absolutely. How did that happen? How do you just get Bertie White and the fellas to just swing by your job? Well, you know, I can tell you a lot of what I did to get to where I am was certainly not calculated. It was just, it was blessed and it was uh, a lot of prayer and it was just a lot of hope and a lot of guts. It just took a lot of courage to be present and to say, hey, I have this dream. Can you help me make it happen? I love um, it, I love it. So basically I, I started working with Scott Frankfurt, my producer, um, just as the uh, production assistant. And I worked there for about a year and I met these guys because they were coming in and they were doing recordings with, um, Evan Ross, uh, Diana, oh, Diana's, uh, son. Diana's son yeah. and his, his wife, Ashley okay. Ashley Simpson. So they were, Simpson, doing, yes. they were doing a duet album. I think it's called I do. And, uh, they had these guys come and be their band. So it was, Oh, Oh man. Earth, Wind and Fire has been, top three bands maybe maybe top two since i was like nine years old so it it was it was such a crazy um life-changing experience to have verdeen walk through the door and say well my name is verdeen and i said well my name's v he said well people call me v i said well please sir you can be v like i will just i'll go into a corner i don't have to exist right now and he's like oh no 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 sweet like you can be v let's be friends and i was just like I, I couldn't believe that he was even talking to me. And then I served their coffee and I served them whatever they needed. And um, I was running around the studio a lot. I was kind of in charge of a lot. So they would see me all day long. Um, and I was just present, you know? Uh, one of the things that John Paris, the drummer of Earth right. Fire said um, to me recently was, I could tell that even though you were, you were helping and that was your job, you were living in the moment and you were enjoying what was being created. And I don't know how he saw that in me, but there was so much joy I had by sitting right there in the corner, just me and my notepad taking notes. Oh, track one, oh, track 11 B, you know, this, this snare and this, this effect, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd help Scott out with, I was just sitting there taking notes and running around and yet he kind of noticed that I had um, a heart for what was happening. So I, I don't know how that happened. I don't know. I, I just know that he just saw me and that wasn't just him. Scott Mayo, the saxophone player uh, previously from Earth, Wind & Fire, but now he, he played with Sergio Mendes for a long time. I think he currently plays in the Sergio Mendes band. Um, and then he has his own album coming out too as well. I'm really excited about that. But Scott Mayo was the other one that really became a good friend. And um, he came up to me eventually and he said, I just noticed that you love being here. And uh, he said, I can tell you're a bit of a silent beast. I don't know what you got going, but you, you got something going because uh, I can see it. Again, don't know why they came up and said these things to me. I was just sitting there probably smiling 
probably bopping along, you know, probably feeling it, maybe making a couple of stank faces. <laughs> but, you know, because it was just so good. They came in with Cool Modi one day. I mean, it, it was just like, it was the most incredible music just being created in every sense of the word. And so I was just sitting there enjoying it all. And they noticed. And we kind of started chatting a little bit around the studio. Um, and then when I was getting ready to leave my job and kind of start my career, um, I told Scott, I have this dream. I see myself in a red suit, sitting at the piano, in your really cool, vibey living room, and I see Verdine at the bass, I see John Paris at the drums, I see Scott May on the sax, I see Jack Majeki on the guitar, I see Mika Moody on the Rhodes, I see Serge, you know, on the electric, and um, we're playing a funk tune. And I didn't know what it was at that point, but I said, it's gotta be funk, because that's what those guys do best. And that's when I remembered Average White Band, because I've always loved that band, and I didn't know them as well coming up, but I started listening to them more when I was at the studio because it reminded me a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire. They're kind of vibed. And I met the drummer from Average White Band. I forget his name, Steve, British, British guy. I can't remember his name. But I thought the story was incredible of the band, you know, and I thought that um, their vibe was impeccable. I listened to almost all their albums, you know, every day. I, I yep. love that band. So when I found If I Ever Lose This Heaven, I wasn't super familiar with that tune, but immediately grabbed my ear. I was like, oh, oh, what's, uh, 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 I feel this. Oh, what is this? You know? <laughs> so I listened to it probably a hundred times and I was like, oh my God, this is the song. This is the song. I need to study this song. So I spent every day, hours, listening to everything the lead singer was doing everything that everything every part of the band was doing i mean i really did my homework because i'm just me and i was trying to do my best to honor what they had already created but also to bring a little bit of the isms to it you know, I, I, didn't know those, I didn't even really know what those were to be honest because i was still kind of figuring out what my brand was what who i was as an artist who i was as a singer um and so yeah so i just told scott hey this is the tune these are the guys. What do you think? <laughs> and he said, well, let's give it a shot. And he called <laughs> Verdine. And Verdine was like, hey, yeah, I'll come down for V. You know, yeah, for sure, for sure. And then John Paris. And they all just agreed. And they came down. We filmed it. They were so happy to be in that room. You could just tell those guys are just, they're just gold. Because they go and they play and they create because they love the music. And you can see the sincerity. You can see it. You can, I mean, the lesson learned here, I'm thinking to myself, okay, boys and girls, what's the lesson here? You've got to communicate and let people know what you want. Now, that may be tough for some people. How are they supposed to know if you don't say it? How you got to let people know. People are mind readers. Absolutely. And you have to be ready. There was Absolutely. something about you that clearly everybody saw. And so they're figuring, why waste this? I don't know, honestly. I, I think they, I think they just lo they loved the song. Of course, they loved the song, and they came and they played it, and they they had a great time. My family came. We we brought them Cuban food. We had a big potluck. Like we had a good day. It was a really good environment. And I remember Jack Majeki specifically walking away from that session saying, "This was one of my favorite sessions." Which is that's big time. And Jack Majeki has played with every known artist that I yep. Think. So it, it was just, it was such an honor. And to have JP, you know, I, I regularly talk to JP. I regularly talk to Verdeem. I regularly talk to Jack. Like I, I had Jack and I had Scott help me on my latest EP. So Scott <laughs> playing horns and Jack wrote on my charts and arranged. So it's just, it was just incredible to kind of build this community with them and for them to trust me with that song and to trust what oh, I'm doing and you're in the pack you're in the pack Whew, I don't know Whew, I don't know how that happened but <laughs> um man I was just so I was just so overwhelmed with joy and um it was crazy because I was really pretty sick that day actually <clears throat> oh you couldn't tell oh yeah I was feeling whew, I was feeling really crappy that day so it was uh 
I kind of had to pull out the professional in me that I didn't know I had, you know, and it was just okay. like, all right, how can I show up? We got all these big dogs in here. I do not want to, I, I need to hang right now. I <laughs> That's to, right. <laughs> I need to hang at least. But more than that, I said, you know, the, I shouldn't sell myself short. I need to lead because I am indeed the lead vocal and I'm doing all the background vocals. I'm playing the piano. Those are all, everything you hear the piano, that's me playing, you know? So I just kind of took it and ran. And that day was a huge step up for my career in terms of who I was and how I felt about how I could present myself. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Lesson number two, boys and girls, lead, take the lead. You know what? For anyone who's been living under a rock, let's help them out here. Right. I want to show the video and we're just going to watch this video. And now I've seen it, I don't know how many dozens of times, but it's going to take on new meaning now that I've heard you talk about the background.
Wow. Love the joy. <laughs> oh time. my goodness. Every time. I, I just love that song. That is great. Any um oh my goodness. Just I'm just thinking any special memories just watching it again. I'm sure you've watched it hundreds of times. You know, I'll throw a little um I'll throw a little romance in there. Okay. So um so I recently got married a year ago. Right. And um his name is Jameson Jordan. And uh at the time that we filmed this video, Jameson and I were just friends and he was pursuing me. He had expressed his interest and I didn't okay. know what to do. I wasn't sure. Okay. All right. So he he's he's walking around. I'm not sure where he's at, but he sends me a picture. I'm looking for my my um outfit for the video. And I'm really stressing out because it's like maybe two weeks before and I can't find it. He finds it for me, like in a random mall somewhere. And he's like, here, I'll grab it for you. So he actually styled me every piece of it. Whoa. It really cool. And he was one of the three people that I invited to come besides my, my parents and my sisters. Like one of my three friends that I invited to come and be a part of that whole experience with me. So before we were ever together, he was helping me out. Uh, he was styling <laughs> me. He was making sure I was taken care of. He served food to Verdine. And he, he tells that story everywhere he goes. You know, I served beans to Verdine White. <laughs> and um, yeah. And then a few months later, uh, we got married. So... <laughs> Well, you got to see him friendship wise, to see who what he was about. It was a couple of the greatest moments of my life. It's like getting there you go. Oh my goodness. My life and then getting to be with these incredible artists. So uh yeah, it's a little extra extraness. All right, a little tidbit. There you go. All right, let me see if I can ask you a question that you probably haven't thought about or heard. Okay, I'm ready. All right, you ready? Yeah, yeah. When you think about your life, what was your earliest or your most vivid recollection of being or feeling different? How would you define different? So for me, that's um, I can answer that question quickly because I felt I felt pretty different growing up because my sisters and I, um, I have four sisters younger than me. So we're all about a year apart until the last one. She came 10 years later. Um, and uh, I was basically like a, a second mom to her, but we were all homeschooled. So we grew up in a really conservative home um, where we actually weren't allowed for a time to listen to any music other than classical. So I'm a classically trained pianist and that was my focus for about 17 years. So that was my whole game. I listened to classical left and right. I was a pianist. I was working as a pianist. Um, but I didn't know who Aerosmith was. I didn't know who Queen was for a while. <laughs> I didn't know who Anita Baker was. You know, I, I, Earth, Wind and Fire was one of those that I had friends playing and I knew about them because I had seen some CDs and I had seen some, so I knew who they were. And my dad loved Earth, Wind and Fire. So he was okay with them. Yeah. Um, but for some reason that was kind of one of the rules of the home. So I felt a little uh, not culturally, you know, well-versed when I started, when I was a teenager and I was coming up, I was trying to make friends. I was trying to go out. I was getting my car and my bank account. I was trying to go out into the world and build my career. Um, and that's very vivid for me because I, I felt like I would never be able to catch up, especially musically. I felt like I was so behind and that no one would respect me for my musicality because I didn't know a lot of the music that, that people did know. And really good music, really, really good music. I mean, I'm sad that I didn't have more years with jazz and funk and, and R&B and soul, which I love now. Um, but it wasn't really until I was 16. And okay. I, actually had to, I actually had to uh, do it when my parents weren't around, where I was just sort of like like leaning into those genres and um nat king cole was the first one i started with and it he just took me there and that's because my grandparents my grandparents are cuban yeah so he's very famous in cuba and so i would listen to all of his spanish albums actually um i'm a latin singer and so um that's most of my job now in the industry and um that kind of started my career was listening to nat king cole and stevie wonder 
Those are the two. So you did get a little bit of Motown in there with Stevie I, and. I sure did. I sure did. I know almost all the Stevie songs, but yeah, you know, I've only had about 10 years with this music. So wow. what's interesting is, and this is the part of my story that I think surprises most people is that I didn't get to live with this since I was a baby. I didn't grow up listening to Stevie Wonder. I didn't grow up listening to Nat King Cole. And so, um, the fact that I have been able to come at this with a whole new set of eyes and I'm rediscovering this music now as an adult and in my music career, it's very interesting. I think it gives me a sense of freshness. It gives me this eagerness. Maybe that's what the guys were talking about in the studio, you know, just being around that music, me getting super hype about what they were creating and, and my mind just being blown about people's creativity and skill. I think I just had an eagerness and a joy that was contagious. And, and um, I've tried to pull that into all of my music. So yeah, really, I've only had music for about 10 years. You know what? I think that's been to your advantage because you're, you haven't been contaminated by a lot of the other stuff. And so that, as I listen to you, I'm thinking, hmm, this is why she sounds so authentic and unique and there's nobody like her is because she hasn't been contaminated with all the other stuff out there to copy that you may not have even been aware of consciously had you been exposed to that. So yeah. you are you. You question solved. You just answered my question. That's great. <laughs> yes, but I, I did feel very, very different from pretty much everyone else around me. Um, so it was it was a little tough in that sense, just like emotionally, but I think I have reaped the benefits now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about what you're doing now. Cause I'm going to go back and forth, but what are you doing now? I mean, I, I saw some stuff with some studios that you're yeah. dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that. So I'm doing a lot now and a, a lot in a lot of different areas. So, um, my, I just updated my website with all this and it's, it's going to keep happening. But, um, my primary thing right now is I'm working as a session singer. Um, in Los Angeles um, and in the Bay Area. So I just sang for Disney's Encanto. Um, I was just able to sing for um, a couple of new TV shows that are coming out, Family Feud, and that's kind of my work right now. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I love being in a group setting. I kind of like not having the spotlight on me too much. I just like being a part of a group effort. Um, I love the people that I'm around. So there's a whole community of studio singers in Los Angeles that's like very tight knit through the union, especially. Um, and so that's my primary job right now, working as a, as a studio singer. I'm also working as a vocal coach in studio. So I've been hired to come on and coach other young artists coming up into the industry who are putting out singles um, or, you know, older folks that are trying to come back into the industry and need some coaching up again. Um, and then just some young people who aren't in it at all, but want to get in. So providing some early mentorship into where to start, which is really interesting that I'm there because, you know, it's, it's only been about four, maybe, maybe good four years since I've been in it, but it's just, it's just escalated so quickly. And I've been able to see so many different things on set, off set. I've been on camera. I've been on TV shows there's a feature film coming out that I'm in singing jazz I and mean, there's just a lot of different things that I've been able to to see and be a part of so I get to share that knowledge with with some young people who are trying to do the same thing um and then I'm putting out an EP um so I yes. started releasing singles first one was released about two weeks ago the second one, Caught Up in the Rapture, Anita Baker, my cover of it was released today. I heard that today. I heard it. That one is my favorite one off of the EP. <laughs> I love that song so much. I was just totally entranced by it when I first heard of Anita Baker. And I started listening to her a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> and man... I, I just love that song. And I, I love what Scott Frankfurt and Jack really brought to the arrangement. Um, and then Scott also vocal produced me. So he helped me kind of come up with a lot of the vocal ideas that you hear. So all the voices are me, 
um, including all the backgrounds in the back, doing all that gospel. God, like that's all me. <laughs> Look, let me tell you something. I, I um, I'm going to get Scott on the show. He's already agreed. Oh, great, great. So, nice. but when I heard that you were going to do Anita Baker, and I've seen Anita Baker live in her prime. Somebody argue, she may argue I'm still in my prime, but anyway, um, I thought, okay, now V's doing okay with the mini Ripperton thing, but Anita. I know. So I said, let me let me try. So what I did, I I put my headphones on just in case, you know, just and I put them on, and I gotta tell you, what's the verdict? Oh. Like it? <laughs> oh my goodness! You you, it, it is it is. You recreated the magic of taking another iconic song mm -hmm. by an iconic singer, yes, and then having me say, "That was great," and not even criticize you for trying to even be somebody else. I mean, no, you did it. I, I just put it out there. You did it. Thank so um but, now whew, the I views about that one. Ooh, I was nervous. Was I'm gonna gamble. I'm gonna gamble that I'm gonna try to be responsible for about maybe five hundred thousand more views on the if I ever get this heaven. I love and it. And then maybe starting out maybe three or four hundred thousand when you for this other one. Cause we're gonna we're gonna blast it. I love, I love it. it. I love it. I love it. This is a good bridge for me to talk about before we close out. Who were some of the uh, influences? You mentioned Nat King Cole. You mentioned uh, Stevie Wonder, yeah. Anita Baker. Who are some of the other people who have influenced you musically? I'd say female-wise, um, early on it was Doris Day and Ella Fitzgerald. Their kind of style of jazz, I think, is what I have loved the most. Um, and I got started singing in a vocal jazz group when I was around 19. So 19 is really when I started to sing and when I really started to figure out what I could do, um, which again was only about seven years ago. So there's still so much more to explore there and I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, and, then, and I would say Stevie probably had the most influence on me um, because he collaborated with so many different artists. I got to hear just just a slew of amazing people. But I would say between those four, that those are probably my strongest influences. Okay. You know, you've been in the business and you've seen it, even though you've had this meteoric, compressed, concentrated, you know, experiences from, from the artistic side. Yeah. What can you share from the business side that people probably should look out for and need to know? From the business side of things, I would say, um, for me and for my career, I think it's really important to emphasize not just integrity in your business, but integrity with people, because people are the key to getting anywhere in this business. Um, my relationships with the people that I've created through business, through networking, through, through jobs, through um, just you know, following them on their socials and encouraging them in their careers, building them up. That has been the reason why I have seen any success in my life. And I 100% believe that. So giving credit where it's due to the people that got me here, you know, there's, there's five, I can, I can count them out or I can tell you who they are right now, you know, who pushed me to be here, who told me I could sing when I didn't think I could, who told me to dream, told me to have courage. Um, so number one, I'd say for business is, is relationships with people and making sure that you understand that that's where it's at. Primarily. Okay. Um, and then in terms of just more business, I, I would say if you're a singer, if you're an instrumentalist, but having a reel, something ready to go to send to contractors who are looking to hire you. If you're trying to do union stuff, join the union. And in order to join the union, um, you've got to be tapped heartly in so meaning you have to have a union job before you can get into the union. So it's kind of a tricky thing for singers. I think you need one for actors and actresses. I think you need three jobs, union jobs. 
so you can actually be a part of the union. But being a part of SAG has been a big reason why I've gotten a lot of those wonderful jobs on TV. Um, so I would definitely recommend being a union member if that's the direction you want to go. TV and cinema and commercial and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, have, have your resources, have, have things that show you off and show off your brand in the way that you want. Have those ready to go, like a Google Drive folder that you can just send right away. Part of the reason why I think I've gotten half of the jobs I've gotten is because I've replied within like 30 seconds with the things that they needed. Wow. You know? um, oh yeah, and it's very impressive to a contractor when they send out a request and they get a response right back with the availability, with professionalism, with kindness, you know, and just an ability to take care of yourself and do the things you got to do at home so that they don't have to babysit you through all this stuff. It's, it's really helpful. Um, so yeah, I'd say get your stuff together in terms of resources, be good to people cause you never know who's in the room. Um, and yeah, I, and be confident in, uh, what your, what your brand is, what, what, it, what it is that you're selling to people. Um, and that's been the, the hard part for me, just figuring out who, what I'm selling and who I am and, and what my style is because I have a lot of different things that I can do. And I just found that that worked really well in the session world because I could pull out an R and B. I could pull out a gospel, you know, I could pull out a choir classical soprano one, you know, these are different things I could pull out that I had on my tool belt. So kind of knowing what I had was really important in the business as well. So I, I would start with those things and then it, it gets, it gets more, Obviously, as you know, it gets more in depth later on as you get more into it. But um, that's a great foundation. Um, before I got into this interviewing business, I was a corporate trainer for Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I used to always tell the managing directors and managers, relationships. You can be the smartest person, but if nobody likes you or wants to work with you, yeah. you're not going anywhere. Yeah. And that's truly, I believe how you got to be where you are and how you have people who want to play with you through your relationships because of your kindness and you're genuine and, and you're just genuine so i mean those, those that's great i'm glad to hear that um yeah. is there anything i've asked that, no is there anything that i haven't asked you that you want to get out there oh let's see yeah i have um my first live show coming up next month, February 18th at the Vibrato Jazz Club. That's Herb Albert's Club, um, which is crazy. Uh, and that's in Bel Air. Well, we'll be sure to put that in into yeah. the recording here. Yeah, um, we'll be doing all the songs from the EP live. Oh. Um, and I will be doing about 10 to 15 more of just other classics from everybody from from Gino to I told Wait you, a minute, Gino Gino Vanelli? Uh-huh, Gino, that Gino, you know. Oh. <laughs> he's one of my favorites. Yeah, to even Brother to Brother is one of my favorite albums. Oh, that's Oh man, that album is I I think in in the world's history it should be like in the top top 10, top 20. It's just such a such a masterpiece so i had to do something from there okay um, and i mean I, i've got so many so many great songs lined up natalie cole i mean oh just just some wonderful wonderful things and um in fact i think one one other thing i'd like to mention is on the ep itself i had some amazing players on this ep by the way i had abe laboreal jr paul mccartney's drummer for the last 20 years I had Jack Majeki again. I had the Abraham Laboreal Sr., one of the greatest bass players in the world. Yep. He played with me on a six string nylon guitar, inseparable Natalie Cole, just me and him as a duet. Oh, oh and I'm so excited for the world to hear that one. It was such a pleasure. Um, I had Hussein Jeffrey, who used to play with Sergio Mendes for about 15 years, my bass player, Brian Scanlon, Scott Mayo again. So I just, I just had some. Amazing. I had Tom Rainier. That's Tony Bennett's pianist, you know, so <laughs> I, 
I had some crazy people. Richie Garcia, he played with Phil Collins. That was his last world tour. He's doing all the percussion on the EP. Um, just some incredible people that I'm so fortunate to say have played with me and I hope have enjoyed it. And um, I really hope that the world enjoys what we have put out there. Um, there's definitely a lot of V-isms, a lot of, a lot of little riffy things, a lot of different kind of arrangements to these songs, trying to bring a fresh contemporary twist to them, but still honor what, what the artists have already created that is such a masterpiece. So I'm excited to play those live for everybody next month. I couldn't be happier for you. And um, I'm telling you, I'm going to do my part to help you just blow up even bigger. Thank you, Gary. Blow up even so bigger. Much. So um, V, it's been great. It's been great. Pleasure. Thank you for reaching out. Man, this is so cool. And congratulations on your talk show. Thank you very much. And uh, for all the rest of the folks here, you'll be able to log on to uh, calculationstalkshow.com, also on all of our social media platforms, and of course on blackmeninamerica.com. So this is Gary Johnson for Calculations Talk Show, and we will see you next time. Thank you, V. Thank you. Earlier today, V dropped her latest single, Caught Up in the Rapture, the Anita Baker classic. Also on her EP is her cover of Joni Mitchell's Help Me. Look, I told you this woman is fearless. And so let's take a listen just to get a sample because I think you really need to check her out and listen to these classic covers. On my mind, constantly. Help me, Johnny Mitchell class. But not like you love your freedom. So there you have it. What do you think? Tell us, let me know. And be sure to support V. Jordan. This is Gary Johnson for Calculations Talk Show. See you next time. And remember, what calculations have you made to be successful? And what have you done to make yourself proud? I'm out.